um, personal incarceration or personal danger, mainly because there are things that you can do that can still support what you're doing without evoking the EDP. And there's been already enough uh, feedback to show that in many cases, the introduction of the ecclesiastical deed into those sorts of cases like foreclosures and, uh, and certainly if you're dealing with traffic, traffic fines or anything like that, just, just, if you like, devalues the importance of it because these courts, these judges, just plead absolute ignorance. So that's another point, just when to use it, and I suggest and I hope everyone can read and have a look uh, and see that it's probably easier to run the process through with the executives and administrators. And if you've already started it, don't worry. If you've already started the process, don't worry. I'm not saying what you've started is wrong. It is not wrong to assert your rights. It is not wrong to stand up and say, I'm no longer a slave. I'm not saying that, so please no one feel that I'm saying if you've started the process, what you've done is wrong. It's not. I'm merely suggesting to those that are still preparing to consider that you use your EDP process in parallel to the court matters you're dealing with rather than conjoin the two together and potentially confuse or raise the stakes uh, in the matter you're dealing with. We'll also include in there the updates on psych evaluations as a number of you have been facing that kind of threat and how to deal with psych evaluations. We've included there some of the biggest lies that they're doing uh, so you can see the kind of answers uh, to concerns because I know a number of you have already ex experienced that where they say I don't understand what you're talking about or it won't work it's not the procedure or the blood thumbprints unlawful all this rubbish absolute rubbish that they're throwing at you so I want, I want you to see that uh, and see the kind of answers that you can prepare in response to that the other one is in the registration process in terms of obtaining an EIN number, a lot of work has been done there uh, and, the, and the application itself has been updated as well and the procedures on how to go about getting it registered has been updated as well. And just the other one, as I say, a lot of it's been updated, but the other one I want to add in there before we move on uh, is the trust accounts, understanding how to set up a uh, trust bank account and what do we mean by a special deposit so I hope all of you who are on the call now and, and those that will listen later can see that we're trying our best always our best to give you the information and answer your questions and while there may be a lot of disinfo out there because there is a huge number of people both in the truth movement and obviously in running the courts that do not want you to be competent and so this is enormously threatening to people who have been making money out of people uh, not getting remedy or just for their own ego don't like the idea that people are becoming competent. In spite of that, you can see that we constantly, constantly are trying to help and understand and learn exactly how to get remedy for all of you because that is your divine right. That is written and these people are in extreme dishonor for refusing that. So I'll leave that up to you all to read at your leisure. Well, I want, I want to talk about uh, foreclosures. I, I actually know, before I do that, I'll answer one question, which is a, a relevant one. Uh, and, and, and this is a, one that uh, a number of you raised, but I wanted to show you just how strong this is. What does the word poll mean in terms of a deed poll? And if you actually go to the introduction uh, page, you'll see that we've inserted this now in the middle, explaining the word poll doesn't mean a survey in the context of this. A poll, when it comes to a deed, actually comes from the ancient Latin word pollex, P-O-L-L-E-X, and it means thumb. So I thought you'd find that interesting all that, that the word poll, as it, as, as it is anciently assigned to a unilateral deed, actually referred to the seal being a thumb. 
So whenever you get some smart aleck prosecutor, attorney, clerk telling you that you have not done a correct instrument, you might say to them, well, in fact, a thumbprint, a blood seal thumbprint is in fact the ancient procedure for a deed poll, not a signature. A signature, in fact, is unlawful in the ancient form of a deed poll. So whenever you get some smart aleck, ignorant clerk telling you, no, I can't accept something in the thumbprint, you've now got something that you can show them. All right, foreclosures. Actually, before I get to foreclosures, I'll, I'll talk about the Canon updates <clears throat> and then we'll get into uh, foreclosures. So on Canon updates uh, on one-heaven.org, I'm sorry if I'm jumping around, but there's a lot of things to cover. On updates of Canon's in, uh, on one heaven under positive law, I've already covered the first, which was the laws of necessity which weren't clear before and are now clear there as a body of canon. Uh, and those canons that were there have now been prepared to go into the canons of administrative law. So nothing's lost. The other one I want to show you, um, which is extremely important, is the aspect of consent. <clears throat> because I know that consent was a, a concern of a number of people in, in how do you send a deed poll even though it's obviously if it's a thumbprint now, that's the ancient process. But how do you send a deed and still claim that it is, is consensual with the other party? So I'm looking at Article 114. And in Article 114 of positive law under one-heaven.org, we have Canon 1418. That's Canon 1418. 18 under Article 114. I just want to read this out to you. Natural birth of the flesh is proof of lawful conveyance from a divine trust to a true trust. I should read that bit again so, so we're clear. Natural birth of the flesh is proof of lawful conveyance from a divine trust to a true trust. As a result, of willing consent by the divine person to be born in accordance with these canons. In other words, a divine trust is formed uh, in accordance with as we spoke. And when we mean divine trust, I know this is a concern of a number of people, so I'll just make it clear. Nothing that I'm saying contradicts one word of Scripture. Because we are dealing with pirates and thieves and vampires of energy, it is no longer enough simply to state that I am a, a living man with a divine agreement. It's no longer good enough to simply state that I have a soul or I'm a spirit because they are using things against us. So to ensure that no one ever dishonours the scriptures and our beliefs ever again. We are extending the concepts so that this grey area is clear. And this grey area is what we mean by uh, divine immortal spirit, what we mean by our soul, what we mean by our relationship with the divine. And in doing so, we strengthen our position against these pirates. So what we're saying here is when a divine trust is created, the divine person, by being part of the divine, can never be considered incompetent. Never be considered incompetent. The flesh is another thing. But the divine person, our soul, can, being part of the divine, can never be considered incompetent. But more importantly, we show that because a divine trust is created, and because these words extend consistently from scripture and belief that it is entirely consistent with what uh, I hope rational and sensible uh, and, and good people would regard as being uh, on the same vibration and the same uh, beliefs that they have in the golden rule and in what divine law means. We're saying that by the, the existence of the flesh that we see a conveyance and we see 
a consent. So let me finish this canon then. Therefore, the existence of the body of a living flesh homo sapien is proof of their divine ecclesiastical consent to obey these canons. In other words, part of when you send an ecclesiastical deed to a Roman official is on the understanding of this canon that their spirit has already agreed by the fact that they are on this earth in flesh, has agreed to the rules of the divine, to divine law. And if the flesh does not honour that deed, then the flesh, by definition, has declared itself incompetent. Now, I, again, I know this sounds like we're playing with words or that we are forming these arguments. But remember, arguments and words and ideas is exactly what they've used against us. And whilst I would rather not be uh, detailed and not go to the extent and spend so much time on this, the reality is that you cannot defeat a system that is a bad idea, a complex bad idea, with just walking away from it. If it is a complex bad idea, then there needs to be something to replace it. If you don't replace it, it stays. That's been the issue with canon law from the beginning. I, I've heard a lot of people say, and in fact this is used against me constantly by people who don't think of what they're saying, or if they do, then they're not being genuine. That is... You can't defeat the canon law of the Roman cult by simply saying we don't agree because by promulgating canon law, what they're saying is this is the rule of law, the norm of law, the standard of law in the absence of a comparable alternative. In other words, if no one stands up and presents an alternative, theirs is true. And that is an argument that cannot be defeated by running away from the challenge. And that's what we're doing now. They are not getting away with people um, by, by claiming it anymore and not being challenged. It is, it is being challenged at the root of being in divine dishonour. So these are some of the updates that have come through and they're very, very important in terms of the, the, co the uh, covenant and the uh, law. But I'll give you another one which is extremely important that is still being worked on and you'll see some more on this. Let's talk about title. Now this blew me away when I saw this come out of the research and I'm referring to title which comes under... Where are we? Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, I'll see it in a sec. Title, title, title. Uh, title, there it is. Article 71. I'm just going to read this and then we're going to move on to foreclosure, as promised. So Article 71, Canon 1049. A title is both a valid inscription or entry into the asset register of a trust and a certificate or notice of proof of such entry and therefore claim of right of ownership. The word title is derived from the Latin word uh, titulus, meaning inscription, label, and notice of entry into a tabulae, with the Latin word tabulae literally meaning register. It was the most commonly used in the context of a register of slaves, and the Latin word for a registrar is tabularis, tabularius. So here is a self-contained system hidden in the word title, coming from the days of slaves, where a title means literally a valid inscription or entry into a register. And then if we go up to Canon 1050, the creation of title occurs upon the valid entry of the claim property into the asset register of the trust, by the recording of a minimal set of information about the property, now also defined as an asset. And then we describe what that is. Now, what do we know about 
the SESA KVs and what is the system geared to doing? 